He was a poor, disgusting loser, but gets reincarnated as a prince with godly abilities. Lloyd was a disgusting commoner who got caught and was about to be executed by a bunch of nobles for being pathetic and ugly. The nobles laugh at him for having the weakest magic in the entire kingdom and claim that he doesn't deserve to live. Before killing him, however, they decide to disrespect him one last time and give him a free chance to use his spells on them. With anger blinding him, he uses his fire magic to attack the noble, but his magic is so bad that the nobles laugh at him once again, which makes Lloyd wonder why was he ever born like this. Following this, the noble decides to end his misery and shoots a fireball back at him to show what real magic is. Lloyd is immediately covered in flames as he screams in agony, but the very next moment he understands what true magic really as he admires the beauty of a noble's magic, while wishing that he could get another chance at life so he can learn more about magic and become the strongest wizard imaginable. The next moment his eyes open, and he finds himself in an unfamiliar room surrounded by maids. He wonders whether this is what heaven looks like and tries to cop a feel on one of them when accidentally he activates a magic spell which bursts through the roof of the castle immediately, surprising himself with how insanely strong his magic is even though he is just a toddler. It turns out that his wish get fulfilled, and not only did he get reincarnated with loads of mana, he also became not only a noble, but the seventh prince of the royal family. A couple of years pass by, and the kingdom seems to be prospering with people living peacefully and everyone earning enough money to eat and sleep happily. Inside the beautiful castle, the maids roam around the corridors to find Lloyd, who is hiding behind a statue to escape them. He starts running in the opposite direction, but runs into some politicians and immediately tells them not to inform the maids where he is. The politician agrees and asks whether he would like to go out for a hunt trying to win his favor, but notices that Lloyd has already ran away. The blue-haired man calls him a stupid kiss-ass for trying to impress the seventh prince as he will never inherit the throne. But the blondie reminds him that Lloyd is the kid who reads spell books when he was not even one year old, refused drinking breast milk like a true gentleman, not to forget that his magic is so strong that he literally blew through the roof of the castle the day his was born. Lloyd, on the other hand, has no interest in the crown and runs around the castle in his new body, which has weirdly thick thighs for a guy, but anything can happen in this woke world. He manages to juke the maids and enters the royal library where his eyes start gleaming at the sight of all the magic books that he can't wait to read. He picks up one of the huge books, but before he could start reading, Sofa, his teacher, finds him and takes him out for sword practice. They engage in a sparring session at an incredibly fast pace, where they attack and counterattack faster than a man could blink, and on first glance, it looks like the prince was able to hold his own against Sylpha and her massive bonkers, but soon she is able to push him back as they take a breather. Lloyd complains about having to practice with a sword every single day, as there is no way he would get the crown being the seventh prince, but Silpha tells him that every person should know how to handle a sword and protect himself regardless whether they are royalty or not. She claims that ever since she started training him three years ago, it's become her obsession and the only purpose. Lloyd tells her to get a life and touch grass sometimes, but she engages once again, only to be met by Lloyd's sword in a perfect block. They start matching each other's attacks and start clashing like Goku and Vegeta, while Silpha acknowledges that the prince's abilities have grown and he is becoming a better swordsman. Lloyd realizes that she is still holding back her true strength, just as usual, but still to match her, he is forced to use control-type magic, which is basically making him copy each and every move that she is making. In other words, he is cheating like my ex, but he is doing it because he wants to read and not because he is a thought. Even after this, however, he is forces back because the difference in their arm strength, reach and height gives her the advantage and puts Lloyd on the back foot as he is pushed back once again. He knows that if he doesn't fight well, she will make him train all evening, so he cheats some more by growing the length of his sword, using magic to grow his forearm like San Sulek, and starts levitating to counter the height difference. 
He engages her once again, but this time she realizes that he is fighting with much more force as they are able to match their attacks with each other attacking and counter-attacking, while Lloyd uses his levitation magic to surprise her from a different angle. He decides to take a boost from the fountain to finish the fight, but Silpha calmly blocks his sword before telling him that he is cheating and slams him to the ground and smacks him on the head. She tells him that she knows he used his magic to increase the length of the sword, which gave him a lot of reach, and also started using levitation magic to increase his height. But instead of getting mad at him, she got moist and started praising Lloyd for being able to use two different magic spells at once, claiming that even the best mages in the court can't do that. Lloyd realizes that she doesn't even know he also increased his arm strength and was using control magic to copy her, but keeps his mouth shut. That evening she takes him for a bath in the bathhouse and puts his head in between her massive plots, while the other girls tell him about the legend of an evil buck inside the dungeons of the castle, which contains the trapped soul of an ancient evil demon. Hearing this, Lloyd couldn't wait and managed to slip by the girls and wandered through the corridors by using his invisibility spell and managed to walk past the knights guarding the doors to the dungeon which contains magic, strong enough to shake the entire kingdom. He manages to find the door to the Forbidden Library, but notices that it is locked by some protective spells, but thanks to his overpowered abilities, he easily nullifies the spell and enters the library while looking like a total futinari. He runs around the library, unable to contain his excitement at the sight of so many books, and decides to read a book, and then reseal the library again. Before he could do anything, a buck erupts from the pile and starts flying around while a weird demonic creature tries to come out of the buck, but the protective charms bind him in place. He commends the boy for being able to break the barrier of the library, while Lloyd asks who the hell is he. The demon calls him a lunatic and claims that he is the ancient demon Grimm and asks Lloyd whether he can release him from the buck. He claims that the seal is worn out anyways after so many years, and it's only a matter of time before he escapes on his own. He then tries to bribe him with a bunch of gold, but Lloyd grabs a piece and squishes it in his fingers, telling the demon that his magic is very basic and unrefined, as he simply used dust to form a gold-like substance. He turns the gold into dust, which surprises the demon while he tells Grimm that he will reseal the library's barrier in a while after he has read some books. The demon starts panicking and claims that the mage who sealed him is dead, and he has no beef with the people of the kingdom. Lloyd doesn't buy his story, but the demon tries one last time and promises to teach him some ancient magic that is not in any of the books. This piques his interest as he immediately asks whether he will truly teach him, Grimm promises to teach him and claims that he has a lot of magic power, which reminds Lloyd of the disrespect he had to face in his previous life. He removes his cloak as everyone knows thick thighs saves lives, and uses his magic to unseal the barrier that sealed him. Grimm emerges from inside looking like a weird mixture of animals, while Lloyd says Uwu teach me magic please. The demon looks at him, and without a second thought blasts him with magic so strong and dark that the entire library gets destroyed and turned to dust. He was ready to destroy the kingdom when the dust gets blasted away, as he notices a huge magical barrier in place which protected Lloyd from the destruction, as he honestly tells the monster that he has never seen this magic before. Grim gets angry and starts throwing dark magic blasts at him in quick successions, but to his dismay, the barrier doesn't even get a scratch as Lloyd tries to understand how to control this dark magic. He gets all steamy at this thought and grabs some of the dark magic around his fingers that shred his fingers like cabbage, while this masochistic freak licks his blood and asks Grim to try his best magic on him. Grim gets pissed off and splits his head into two and starts chanting two different incantations before combining the two spells and shooting an extremely strong magic blast at the boy. To his absolute surprise his magic causes zero damage to the barrier once again which scares him, and he immediately tries to run away from the Uwu freak, only to hit a barrier laid out in front of him. Lloyd tells him that he wanted to be careful, so he placed another barrier outside to prevent Grimm from running out and destroying the kingdom. Grimm again starts preparing a destructive spell, 
but Lloyd tells him to stop and to show him his best defensive magic. After saying this, Lloyd chants a spell and shoots a magic ball so strong that it basically turns the entire barrier into a lava pit, barbecuing Grimm while Lloyd watches him from above. Soon after, Lloyd uses his magic to completely renovate the library to the condition. It was in before Grimm destroyed everything which shocks Grimm beyond belief as he starts calling him daddy. Lloyd realizes that demons can never die and starts contemplating whether he could make Grimm his test subject to try all the new spells. Grimm immediately bows down and begs for mercy, promising Lloyd to become his familiar forever which Lloyd agrees to. He then tells Lloyd that he looks too ugly so Grimm immediately transforms into cute little goat while Lloyd tells him to come in his pocket. Grimm laughs in his mind while hatching a plan to take control over Lloyd's body once he is close enough, but the moment he touches his body, Grimm realizes that Lloyd's mana is so strong that he can't even control his fingers let alone his body. He immediately starts acting like a subservient arch while thinking about different ways he could defeat Lloyd and destroy the kingdom one day. A couple of weeks pass by without any issue when one day, while he was reading some books in the library, his older brother Albert, who is the second in line to the throne, comes in and greets him before asking whether he wants to practice with him. The young prince obviously agrees and goes downstairs where Prince Albert shows off his magic by using high fireball to hit the targets in the dead center, while all the maids and his underlings clap. The next turn belongs to Lloyd who walks up to the area, but realizes that he needs to hide his true powers, so he intentionally decides to just clip all of the targets one by one with his fireball, instead of hitting them in the middle. Everyone claps for him as well, while one of the bald politicians makes fun of Lloyd by claiming that he can only graze the targets unlike Prince Albert, who can hit all the targets in the center. Albert looks at him annoyed and tells everyone to follow him upstairs, but tells Lloyd to play and practice as much as he wants. Lloyd is overjoyed at this opportunity as now he can truly use his magic to the fullest. He then turns towards Grimm and tells him that he wants to try his special magic where he used two different spells at once. Grimm is surprised and tells him that only demons can do that because they can create multiple heads, but Lloyd is stubborn and claims that he has an idea. Without any warning, he uses his magic on Grin, which sucks him inside his hand, and they try to chant two different spells at once. The first time they fail, as Lloyd was trying too complex of a spell, but he refuses to back down and the next time when they start chanting, Lloyd gets in his groove, while Grim gets scared as he feels the unbelievable amount of mana welling from inside of the young prince. Grimm also realizes that not only is he trying to use two very complex spells, he is trying to combine magics that belong to two different class and are opposite to each other. The reality around them starts breaking as the power gets condensed into two small balls, which he then combines and shoots up in the sky with a tremendous bang, which was seen all over the kingdom. When the dust settles, Lloyd notices that he has destroyed the training yard, and moreover there is a massive hole in the sky. He gets terrified, but thankfully, the hole disappears with time and everything seems to be fine. The next day, Grimm brings the newspaper to show a picture of the hole in the sky on the front page, but Lloyd's attention is turned towards the article about an adventuring party gaining lots of loot inside of a dungeon. This makes him decide that he wants to go to a dungeon, so he takes out a piece of acorn and uses his magic to create an exact replica of himself, which mirrors everything that Lloyd does. After that, he takes Grimm back into his arm and flies off to find a dungeon. But it turns out that half of Grimm's soul is magically transmitted inside the clone back at the castle, so they can communicate. Back inside the castle Grimm looks in the mirror to admire Lloyd's work, while the prince himself flies fast and far, when they suddenly spot a girl running away from a bunch of orcs. They drop down on a hilltop to observe, but to their surprise, the girl uses a special breathing technique to gain energy and burst through the first couple of orcs, defeating them one by one before exploding the last orc with a Kai blast that Lloyd has only read in books before. The girl immediately notices him and rushes up the mountain thinking that he is an enemy, but in that time, Lloyd uses his imitation magic to make himself look taller and older. The girl immediately falls for his looks and introduces herself as Tawa B. Rank Warrior from another continent. He asks whether she knows the location of any dungeons and to impress him, she agrees to party up with him. They go inside the dungeon, where she destroys any monster that comes in front of her, while Lloyd collects glowing rocks. Some time later, while they were having lunch, Lloyd asks whether she was using Kai to get her energy, 
and she replies yes, while claiming that not many people know about it. While she was explaining what it is, she gets shocked to see that Lloyd already starts trying to copy her technique just by looking and manages to feel a new sort of energy inside him which makes him really happy. Later she takes him deeper into the dungeon where a monster wolf jumps at them, but she immediately uses her Kai Blast to kill it. Lloyd is really impressed by this, and they move towards the center of the room together to finally check what's inside the chest. Tao tells him that she doesn't think there would be anything extraordinary in a low-level dungeon like this, but notices that Lloyd is constantly trying to use Kai breathing, which makes her incredible happy as she starts thinking about marrying him. She moves forward happily to open the chest, but the moment she tries to lift the lid, a black blade emerges from the ground and would have sliced her in half if not for Lloyd who shoved her away as the blade slashed even the rocks behind them. Completely shocked, they back off a bit as they see a huge skeleton rising from beneath the treasure chest, ready to kill anyone in the area. Lloyd asks Tao what the hell is this monster and Tao's heart sink as she realizes that this is a lick. She immediately turns towards Lloyd apologizing as she uses a Kai technique to utterly blast him away towards the exit of the chamber. The lick immediately uses its magical blades and starts attacking Tao while she simply dodges and jumps around before kicking one of the blades, which makes her realize how powerful this lick is. She doesn't understand why would such a strong monster that even the rank adventurers might struggle against roaming around in such a low-level dungeon. She decides to keep the lick distracted so that at least Lloyd can escape the dungeon safely. Meanwhile, Lloyd is still in the air, getting blasted away, while he wonders why Tao did this, and uses his barrier ability to slow himself down while unknowingly crushing two other smaller monsters. He looks at his hand and tries to talk to Grimm only to realize that something went wrong as Grimm seems exhausted and tells Lloyd to come home as soon as possible. Back in the boss room, Tao is somehow managing to destroy and block all of the Lick's attack, but has gotten severely injured in the process. She realizes that if this keeps up, there is no way she will be able to survive. She tries to slowly back off thinking that Lloyd must have also escaped by now, when to her absolute surprise, Lick speaks up and tells Tao that Kai magic seems to be one of the lowest forms of magic and claims that he defeated and ate a Kai magic user once, and he tasted horrible. According to him, if he eats anyone, he gains their knowledge and skills, but tells Tao that she is so weak that he doesn't even want to eat him, but asks her about Lloyd, claiming that there was something different about him as his reaction time was insanely good as he saw through the surprise attack. She tells him that the man was named Lloyd, and even though everyone on this racist continent looks down upon Kai techniques, he found it fascinating and wanted to learn it. Following that she takes a deep breath and starts attacking the monster while it hides behind his barrier, mocking her, claiming that her weak attacks can never break his shield. She continues to attack, landing a barrage of hits while thinking about how she has been working her ass off and training every single day since she was five to reach at the position she is. She pushes herself one last time and breaks through the barrier, only to find that the lick is disappeared. She falls to the ground out of exhaustion while the lick speaks up from behind, claiming that her strength is even weaker than the magic present in his single finger, making her a very boring enemy to fight against. He claims that she wasted his time and shoots a massive magical shard at her. Just as he thought it was over, his shard shatters into a hundred pieces, as it turns out that Lloyd arrived at the last moment and saved Tao's life with his barrier. He tells her that she did very well, claiming that he will take over from here and finish this monster. Tao is confused and looks at Lloyd only to see a crazed look on his face, as he itches for a fight. The Lick starts chanting a spell, but before he could attack, Lloyd uses a Kai technique to quickly run behind the Lick. The Lick is shocked at his speed, while Lloyd takes a deep breath and hangs upside down on the rocks, protecting himself with his barriers, while the Lick tries to land attack after attack, only to fail every time. Lloyd ignores the Lick's attacks, and thinks about what Tao has taught him about the Kai, till now as he takes a deep breath and starts sprinting around the cave, while the Lick keeps attacking him to try and break his barrier. Lloyd realizes that his barrier is blocking the flow of air, so he decides to break his own barrier. This pleasantly surprises the Lick who immediately shoots a bunch of magic blasts at him, hoping to end the fight quickly. 
But Lloyd hangs from a rock and jumps away, dodging the attacks one by one as he parkers through the entire cave. He finally gets the hang of it, and merges his Kai with his mana, to create an incredible strong magic attack. He dodges some more attacks, before throwing the magic attack around him to destroy all of Lick's attacks, surprising both Tao and the monster. Lloyd is not done yet though, and creates some more magic razor blades, and starts shooting it at the Lick who tries to block his attacks, but is forced to expend way too much magic to only counter Lloyd's incredibly strong strikes. The Lick is bewildered and cannot believe his eyes as Lloyd is attacking way too quickly and by merging his magic with Kai techniques, he has surpassed the powers of the Lick himself. The monster gets cut on the face which gives Lloyd some confidence as he starts making his blades thinner and sharper, forcing Lick to shell himself within his magic barrier. But to everyone's surprise, Lloyd's incredibly strong magic blades cut through the barrier alongside the Lick destroying him once and for all. After that they look through the treasure chest only to find an old knife inside, which Tao couldn't care less about, Lloyd asks whether he can take it. And she agrees but soon the entire dungeon starts trembling, shocking him. She tells him that this is normal, and every time a dungeon's treasure gets looted, the cave collapses and the dungeon disappears forever. They are able to escape outside safely, while Lloyd looks at the dungeon entrance getting shut which fascinates him. Lloyd suddenly remembers that Grimm needs him and tells Tao that he needs to leave and thanks her for showing her around the dungeon. Tao shouts at him from behind, claiming that the final spell that he used is known as a Kai Blade and even she has never been able to use it, but promises him that she will get stronger and learn how to use all the Kai techniques. Lloyd tells him that he will learn some more techniques from her soon and zooms away in the sky immediately. He flies through the landscape as quickly as possible, and enters his room secretly, only to find Grimm on the floor, with injuries all over his body. It turns out that Silpho wanted to train him, but realized that he was much weaker than before so she decided to train her all day long, which completely drained Grimm of all his energy, even though he is a demon himself. Later that day, he shows Grimm the knife that he found in the dungeons, claiming that it seems to be enchanted by some spells. He immediately gets some water and uses a special magic to slowly scrape off all the magic enchantments present on the knife. Grimm tells him that magic enchantments are pretty rare and difficult to do, but Lloyd decides to learn how to enchant weapons himself and purifies the water containing the enchantment to realize that he needs oil, silver, and some weapons to practice. He asks his father for some silver, which he is very happy to provide, but Silpha tells Lloyd that she will give him some oil only if he is able to land a hit on her. They start sparring and Lloyd tries his best to match the skills of Silpha, and even uses his acceleration technique to emerge behind her before trying to land an attack. Silpha dodges. Lloyd immediately uses an earth spell to create some barriers, but she dodges that as well, and smashes the boulders, defeating and catching Lloyd in her arms. Even though he lost the match, she still gives him the oil as she is just happy that he didn't perform as bad as he did the other day. Grimm and Lloyd go into their secret dungeon and melt down all the silver coins before using the oil to imbue magic inside of them, creating a solution which can help them in enchantment. The final thing they need is weapons, so he goes to his older brother Albert and tells him about how he wants to practice enchantment and wants some weapons. Albert immediately tells his guard to give him some weapons, and the guards put down as many weapons as they had, while they all cry thinking their weapons are as good as lost, because enchanting is super hard and a ten-year-old child can never do it. Lloyd and Grimm take the weapons down into the dungeons where they start applying enchantments on them, but the steel is not strong enough and breaks into hundreds of pieces. Lloyd doesn't accept defeat though and keeps trying breaking several weapons while being aided by Grimm and his clone who brings him tea. Finally, he returns back to Albert, reporting that out of 120 swords that he got, he was able to successfully enchant 50 swords, while the rest broke. Albert is beyond surprised as even the ranked enchanters only have a success rate of 10%, while Lloyd thinks about how he technically enchanted 80 blades, but he tried adding some more spells on them, and they broke leaving only 50 swords who can't be enchanted anymore. The knights think that he is lying about the enchantments and puts his sword back in his sheath, 
but the sheath splits in half in an instant. Albert is really impressed and asks Lloyd whether he would want to go on a monster hunting expedition with him, and Lloyd happily agrees. If you liked this video, make sure to subscribe for the next part. The next morning, Albert and his party leaves from the castle in a carriage. While Lloyd sleeps inside peacefully, they travel through beautiful farmlands, and the sweet smell of wheat finally wakes him up as he checks on Grimm who was chilling out as well. A little while later Albert finally points at the entry of forest, which gets Lloyd really excited as he asks Silpha whether they can find monsters nearby. She calmly replies that most monsters are found near the lake and not in the forest, before asking whether he is enjoying his outing. Lloyd seems to be pretty happy because he doesn't really get a chance to roam outside the castle very easily, and he is also excited to see how his enchanted swords will perform. Suddenly Silpha unsheathes her sword, scaring Albert who thought he said something wrong, but Silpha claims that monsters are nearby. Just on cue, a bunch of monsters known as kobolds emerge from the woods and surround Lloyd's carriage. Silpha immediately jumps off, while the knights form a protective wall around the princes. Lloyd pretends to be surprised by the attack, but Grimm claims that he knew about the presence of these monsters ever since they entered the forest. It turns out that Lloyd has been trying to use spectral detection, which is a Kai technique he recently learned which lets him know about the location of any enemies that might want to attack. Grimm is very impressed by this, as it is supposed to be a very difficult technique, but Lloyd has already managed to continuously use it for the past 24 hours. The kobolds and the knights clash, but to their surprise, the sword easily cuts through the monster's armor like butter. This scares the knights as well who have never used a sword so sharp before, and even after cutting down most of the monsters, they scared stiff because of the fact that they could cut themselves. Albert starts praising Lloyd for enchanting the sword so perfectly that even the rank enchanters can't compare to him, while Silpha also praises him while standing on top of a mountain made up of monster corpses. Even though Lloyd never enchanted her sword, suddenly, a stray kobold emerges from the bushes and tries to attack Lloyd, but thankfully, Tao appears out of nowhere and kicks the monster away. She starts looking around for Lloyd as she sensed that someone was using Kai magic, but because Lloyd is in his kid form, she can't figure it out. Suddenly, the kobold recovers and tries to attack her again, but Silpha stabs it immediately before telling Tao to back off and not to touch Lloyd so casually. They were about to start a catfight, but Albert saves the day by telling Tao that she could accompany them till the lake if she wants. They reach by the lakeside as the moon rises up in the sky and Albert thanks Tao for saving Lloyd's life, but she still looks confused as she tries to find the traces of Kai magic that she sensed. Lloyd is relieved that his secret is not revealed and wanders back into his tent only to get strangled by an overprotective Silpha. Tao ends up witnessing all this and calls Silpha, a creep which pisses her out, they start bickering amongst themselves while the knights think that they are in heaven as they surround the girls to watch them. Lloyd slips by and walks away, thinking how this is even more suffocating than when he was in the castle. Albert starts talking to Lloyd and tells him to be wary of girls as relationships can be really scary. Meanwhile, the girls notice the boys being boys and beat the crap out of all of them which they probably liked. Silpha finally puts on her skirt, while Tao tells her that she is here to repair the chapel which is present on top of the hill, and Silpha tells her to get on with it and leave. But Albert stops her and claims that she shouldn't go up there at night as it could be very dangerous. He tells her that they should stay together and leave at the break of dawn, when suddenly Lloyd senses something. Immediately there's a huge blast as a giant monster appears out of nowhere making Lloyd really happy as this is the first monster that he saw in a forest. Everyone gets ready for a fight while Lloyd simply sits down on a box while Silpha stands in front of him for protection. The monster, which turns out to be a bear wolf, attacks the knights with a surprising speed, which impresses Lloyd, but he notices that Grimm seems to be lost in his thoughts. The bear wolf chases one of the knights who is saved by Tao, who uses her special Kai blast to knock it down. This is not enough, though, as the bear wolf gets up and attacks again while Tao dodges away. Albert finally walks up and unsheathes his sword before he starts chanting a spell. The swords start hovering behind him while draws all the magic power out of it and shoots a fireball at the monster. The spell completely barbecues the beast while everyone watches in awe at the strength of the heir to the throne. And the knights start celebrating and shouting Albert's name, claiming that his magic is the strongest, 
Albert tells them that his spells are not usually this powerful, but because of Lloyd's enchantments, his magic got boosted as well. While the knights and Albert think that the fight is over, Grimm calls Lloyd and tells him that he just remembered that the chapel on top of the hill was used to trap a pretty strong demon a long time ago. Before he could ask any questions however, the seemingly dead monster gets up once again, surprising every single person in the area, and literally in front of their eyes, a huge horde of monsters appear around them. Suddenly a hand pokes out of the bear wolf's mouth and a demon appears from it introducing himself as Paz and promises that he will kill every single person present here. The monsters immediately attack Albert and his party who try to stand their ground, but to their surprise, their attacks are pretty useless, because the beasts regenerate immediately. Tao kicks one of the monsters away and tells Albert that this is getting out of hand as they can't defeat these many monsters alone. The knights try to gang up on the monsters, but it's all in vain as they simply regenerate after every attack. Silpha tells Lloyd to hide behind the barrels, and he follows her instructions before asking Grimm whether he knows this monster. Grimm replies that although he doesn't know Paz personally, he is pretty sure that he was the demon who was imprisoned in the chapel on the hill. He further explains that Paz seems to be using his mana to control all the other beasts like a puppet, and is using his mana to heal any damage inflicted upon them. Lloyd hears in awe before plopping Grimm to the ground, and asks whether he could teach him how to do that. Grimm is shocked to see that he wants to learn the magic in the middle of this huge fight. Tao tries to stand her ground, and fight back while Sofa calls her weak for not being able to defeat such weak monsters. Paz seems to be having a great time as he realizes that he is winning the battle, as these people don't know how to deal with so many monsters at once. Unfortunately, he makes a big mistake by making fun of Lloyd, as he calls him a useless kid who needs a babysitter to protect him. This really pisses Silpha off, who asks Lloyd whether she could leave him for a moment. Lloyd doesn't really care as he is busy learning how to control mana. Suddenly everyone feels a wave of dread, as they realize that Silpha seems to be serious right now. She grabs her sword and walks towards Paz fearlessly who makes fun of her even more. But Silpha calls her an ugly incel who has never smelt a girl before. This pisses him off, and he tries to attack her. But to everyone's surprise, Silpha not only dodges the attack, but chops off all four limbs of the beast. Paz gets really annoyed at this, and starts using all of his mana to recover the bear wolf's limbs. During this time, Albert notices that the other monsters have stopped regenerating altogether, which means that if Silpha keeps dealing damage to the main body, they can defeat the smaller monsters without them being able to heal. While all this is happening, Lloyd is busy learning how to control the flow of mana, while Grimm tells him that at first he should try to shape it into something, then he can try to put some color into the object, and lastly he could try to add smell to the object, but claims that it is very hardcore stuff. To his surprise, by the time he turns around, Lloyd has already created a flower made up of mana with different colors, and an amazing smell. They sniff at the flower like junkies beneath a bridge, while Silpha keeps styling on Paz and his bear wolf. As she knocks them to the ground one more time, she asks the knight beside her to give her his sword for a moment, and he immediately agrees. While Paz is confused about who this maid is because she literally has no gaps in her defenses, he doesn't understand why a swordsman who is so strong just want to be a babysitter to a worthless child, but to Silpha. Lloyd is her everything, as she admires the sword which was enchanted by him. Paz decides to play some mind games with her, and starts laughing as he claims that he has gotten interested in the child that she is trying to hard to protect. He promises her that he will tear him apart piece by piece, and then he will examine each and every broken part of the boy before he burns the pieces, as they will probably be nothing out of the ordinary anyways. He starts running circles around Silpha, trying to confuse and provoke her, and it seems to be working as she gets mad with rage. Paz takes advantage of this moment and jumps in to attack, thinking that he finally broke her defenses, as even the strongest humans are stupid, and can be easily provoked, after which it's easy to to kill them. To his surprise, however, Silpha appears in front of him while inside the beast's mouth and asks who the hell does he think he is fighting. Paz is so shocked that he doesn't even know what to say, while Silpha pushes her sword through the beast's mouth and splits it in half before jumping up in the air, 
against the moon. She dives back in once more and decapitates the bear wolf, revealing the demon inside who completely loses his composure and tries to attack. But Silpha is one step ahead. She jumps back from the beast's head and stabs the demon in the eye and the mouth before completely slashing the bear wolf's body into small pieces, throwing Paz outside completely naked. She delivers another solid strike which slashes Paz all over the body as he gets blasted into the ground, shocking every single person around as they shake with fear because they have never seen Silpha this angry. Even Lloyd is surprised to see Silpha's true strength and realizes that even he can't defeat her if she goes in full force. Silpha however only has one target as she slowly moves towards the incapacitated Paz, telling him to get ready to taste the cold touch of the sword that was enchanted by the boy who he threatened to kill. Silpha tells the demon to simply surrender as there is no way she is going to let her live. But to her surprise, Paz simply smiles and starts breathing a weird pink gas out of his mouth. This seems to increase the regeneration of the monsters who once again try to attack Silpha from behind. But Albert and Tao hit the monsters with a power blast each, saving Silpha from getting ambushed. Albert commands the troops to form a defensive line around Silpha and make sure none of the monsters can pass through so that she can deal with Paz, but suddenly the black smoke reaches them, and all of a sudden they start losing consciousness as they feel a terrible pressure and fall over to the ground. Tao realizes that this is not good, while even someone as strong as Silpha is not able to deal with this demonic gas and falls to her knees. Paz gets up and stretches his wings as he talks about how it has been over a century since he broke through the shrine that sealed him and ever since he was collecting monsters that Silpha slashed like nothing. This angers him, and he hits her straight in the face, blasting her off into the sea. Albert tries to call out to her and help, but his body can't generate any power. The demon flies up and claims that whoever inhales the demonic gas loses all their strength and simply get knocked out, which gives him ample of time to kill them however he wants. Silpha, however, is not one to be bested so easily, and tells him that his gas stinks, which annoys him, and he tries to finish her off with a kick. Thankfully, Tao reaches just in time and blocks the kick, saving Silpha's life while the demon looks confused as to how Tao is not unconscious yet. Tao asks Silpha whether she can stand up, but Silpha tells her to mind her own business as she can deal with this on her own. Tao screams at her for lying as she can't even move her body, but Silpha cuts her off and tells her that she should run towards Lloyd and make sure he is safe before she falls over into the water unconscious. Paz commends Silpha's strength claiming that she must be one of the strongest fighters alive because she was able to take so much of his dark magical smoke and yet defied him for so long. Suddenly he appears behind her and with a creepy face asks why the hell is she not being affected by the smoke yet. She tries to kick him away but he dodges the hit and immediately uses his tentacles to grab her leg before giving her an electric shock. He holds her upside down, as he realizes that she is using some weird breathing technique that is helping her withstand his smoke. He asks why the hell did she not run away when she had a chance. Tao believes in pretty privilege and immediately elbows him in the face like Alex Pereira, claiming that she would never become a slave for someone as ugly as him. She jumps up and then uses one of her most powerful spell, which creates such a strong impulse that he is blasted into the water. She realizes that it might have been a mistake, because she needs to recover her breathing before he counters. But unfortunately, one of the dog monsters attack her from behind and try to gulp her down. She somehow manages to keep the jaws open as she realizes the monsters have been regenerated already. The demon wakes up and tells her that her entire party was nothing but trash, and she is the only person of interest alongside the swordswoman, so he will take both with him. Immediately he releases his magic smoke to its full extent as he tells her to give in and become his minion, but to his surprise, the girl manages to stay in her senses, and tells him that she can sense her prince in shining armor nearby, which is giving him courage and strength. Paz tells the dog to gulp her down and the monster swallows her alive. He looks around to see that the battle has been won, and now it's time to pay back. He picks the unconscious body of Silpha out from the water, claiming that she killed a lot of her minions, and will have to pay for that by becoming his minion herself. He claims that he will fill her up with his magic smoke, and make her serve as his attendant till the day he dies. Meanwhile, Lloyd is still playing in the background and asks how he managed to control the monsters. Paz gloats about how he killed the parents of these monsters while they were still pups and then used his magic smoke to take control over their body and make them follow him. 
Suddenly, he remembers that there should be no one conscious enough to talk which scares him, and he turns around to see Lloyd playing with one of the dog bowls. He asks Lloyd about how is he moving through his smoke so easily and without any damage. Suddenly, Paz also notices that Grim is a demon and asks whether he is protecting the little kid and starts making fun of him for falling so low as a demon that he became a babysitter. This pisses Grim off, but he knows that Paz isn't going to say the light of day anyways. So he swallows his anger and tells him that he was going to give him some advice as a fellow demon. But now all he wants to do is watch him die in pain. Paz laughs at this and sends in his demon dogs to tear the boy to shreds. Lloyd seems pretty happy about this, as this will give him an opportunity to try his newly learned mana transmutation magic. Grim tells him that he will have to put out quite a bit of mana for this. But it doesn't matter to Lloyd as he starts fixing his mana output and uses it to create a warm and gentle bed of flowers. This breaks the monsters out of the demon's control and makes them remember the warmth they felt when they were with their family, and how Paz killed their parents. Paz is beyond baffled as he watches Lloyd surrounded by his monster dogs as he pets all of them. Lloyd then walks over to one of the dogs and asks him to spit out what he ate. The dog immediately spits an unconscious Tao out of his mouth and lays her down on the ground. Paz tries to regain control and blasts a load of magic smoke out, but Grimm tells him that it won't be enough anymore as these monsters are all grown up and mad with anger. All the dog wolves attack Paz with an incredible speed and start tearing him to shreds by their pack hunting techniques. Lloyd is pretty intrigued by their strategy as they all move forward to chew the demon out. But Paz immediately regains control and bashes the heads of the dogs against each other before throwing them down in the water. He gets so pissed at them, not following his orders that he goes down and starts kicking one of them in the body, screaming at him for not following orders as he promises to kill his remaining family the moment he is done with this kid. While Lloyd watches as Paz gets mad with anger and his body starts leaking mana everywhere, Lloyd wonders to himself about why the demons don't die which forces the wizards to seal them with one trick or another. Paz on the other hand starts extending his overpowering mana, completely killing off all the flowers created by Lloyd who comes to the conclusion that maybe the wizard just didn't have magic strong enough to kill a demon. Suddenly the entire area turns dark as Lloyd uses his domain expansion, causing Paz to stand like an idiot as he gets paralyzed with fear. Grim finally tells Paz why his magic smoke never had any effect on Lloyd and claims that Lloyd's mana is so incredibly high that there was no way Paz's minuscule mana pool could ever overpower him. Meanwhile, Lloyd gets excited to try out all the new spells he wanted to use. Paz realizes that the kid's mana is way too much as he starts sweating. When Lloyd tries to trap him in a shield, but he barely escapes, this confuses Paz at first, but this he realizes that this isn't even a fight to Lloyd and he is simply having fun and want to trap him in a cage like a lab animal so that he can experiment his strong magic on him. He starts escaping the area as fast as possible. While Lloyd keeps creating barriers pinballing the demon all over the place, he then turns towards Grin and tells him to help him trap the demon and Grim obeys. After this they are able to put twice as many barriers in half as much time, and even Paz realizes that this is too much as he tries to run away, but gets caught in the end. The demon tries to run away, but the barrier is too strong, and he is kept inside of it, which makes him start begging for his life, as he promises to give Lloyd a very high position in his court once he becomes the king of this world. But Lloyd doesn't care about all that, and alongside Grimm, he starts compiling a bunch of spells together. He combines the spells of all the different elements before multiplying them by 100 and deploys them with triple the intensity, completely blasting the demon inside the barrier for 30 straight minutes just to see how much damage can he take. After watching for a while, he finally releases the demon from the barrier, who looks completely withered and half dead as he stands in the air unmoving. The demon starts turning to ash while Lloyd realizes that everyone is starting to wake up so he immediately runs away to avoid any suspicion. He meets up with Albert, and when Albert asks what happened to the demon, Lloyd lies that an incredible magician named Robert killed it and ran away. A couple days later, Albert and his party return to the kingdom to great fanfare, where they are presented in front of the king who commends them for being able to hold their own against such an incredibly powerful demon. Albert claims that there were two other people as well, Tao and the mysterious magician Robert. Tao wanted to find Robert so she went inside the forest and didn't come back. The king seems to be happy and tells Albert that he is doing good as the second prince, and has a high chance of becoming the next king. But Albert claims that Lloyd is the one who was the most helpful as without his enchanted weapons, they could have never done anything. 
To everyone's surprise, he then asks the king to also include Lloyd in the race to become the new king, and the king accepts. They rush towards him and cuddle with him till he is all tattered. Later, Lloyd, Silpha, and Shiro return home, and Silpha wants him to train with her immediately. Lloyd doesn't want to, and then suddenly, Albert comes to his rescue. He claims that he needs to talk with his younger brother about something, but Silpha doesn't want him to. She can't disobey Albert in the end, and he tells Lloyd that he wants him to meet someone. That someone is the fourth Prince Diane, and Lloyd is a bit taken aback to see him. They visit Diane's blacksmith workshop, which is situated in the middle of a small pond, where he wants to talk to Lloyd about the sword enchantments he did earlier. Diane smacks the table with his hammer, saying that he doesn't truly believe that a kid like him could do that. Which is why, he wants to see him in action. Lloyd is nervous, and Albert tells him that ever since he was ten, Diane has been learning the art of blacksmithing, and he is interested in enchanting. He gets flustered on hearing that, and tells Lloyd to immediately get to work. Lloyd takes the sword given to him, and begins inscribing the enchantments on them under Diane's watchful gaze. He finishes the enchantments soon, and Diane is completely dumbfounded by what he sees. Not only was Lloyd much faster and more accurate than the master enchanters he has met, he has put more spells on the sword than humanly possible. Diane is impressed by his brother's skill, and accepts Lloyd as a true genius. He lifts him up, saying that with his help, he can achieve his dream of creating the ultimate magic sword. Lloyd is curious and Diane explains that a magic sword is formed when the hot steel is enchanted during the process of forging. That makes the sword even more powerful, and a skilled smith and enchanter must work together to create something like that. Diane says that he has no talent for magic, and he understands how other people who lack magic feel. That is why he wants to create magic swords, so that everyone can use magic spells just by swinging their swords. Lloyd doesn't care about his brother's dream, but he is interested in the production process, and gladly agrees to help him. They begin working soon, and Lloyd gets into the femboy apprentice uniform. Diane says that they will create a sword with the fireball magic stored in it, and Lloyd suggests putting a high-level fire magic there. Diane says that it won't work, because the high-level spell has 14 parts in it, and a magic sword can only hold 5 parts at max. That's no problem for Lloyd, and he compresses the high-level spell into just 2 parts. He creates the enchantment and puts it on the red-hot steel slab, which shatters under the weight of the complex spell. Lloyd decides to simplify the spell, and creates more enchantments. Diane suddenly notices Silpha and Shiro staring at them from outside and invites them in to help them. The new enchantments Lloyd creates are somewhat more stable, but as Diane tries to fold and shape the sword, the molten steel mass breaks yet again. Lloyd feels guilty for wasting everyone's time and efforts, and wonders why is the spell not working despite simplifying it this much. Grim pops out of Shiro's fur and notices Lloyd looking tense, and then he suddenly spots the enchantment liquid he is using. Diane is telling Lloyd to chin up because they will definitely succeed. When Grimm comes to him and reveals that the enchantment ink is of very low quality, even Diane admits that he bought it because it was cheap, and Lloyd is not happy about it. He uses the purification spell on the essence to see its constituents, and finds that the amount of the monster core in it is very less, which is not enough to create a magic sword. Diane doesn't have any monster core lying around either and Lloyd thinks that he must clear a dungeon to obtain it in that case. Silpho was thinking the same and suggests that they should go dungeon hunting. Lloyd is flustered and tries to cover up his past by saying that a prince like him can't go to a dungeon. However, Silpho reveals that she has already sought permission from the king, who believes that letting Lloyd explore the world will help develop his character. The next day, they head to the Adventurer's Guild, and Lloyd is amazed to see it. The receptionist Katarina welcomes them, and gives them the paperwork to fill out if they want to register as adventurers. A few days later, Lloyd has successfully taught Shiro some tricks like shaking hands and standing on its rear paws. Silpha claps at this, but Lloyd is not satisfied because Shiro still struggles with following complex commands like changing the pitch of his bark and rotating three times, and then lying on its back. He states that he tried putting commands in his mana and sent it to the giant furball, but it doesn't understand what those commands mean in the first place. 
so it gets confused. Silpha suggests him to talk to someone who is expert in taming monsters, and both of them realize who they must see for that. The person who can help them control Shiro is Princess Elise, who lives in her garden tower that is full of all kinds of creatures living in harmony. Grimm is stunned to see the garden tower and asks Lloyd, who is the girl named Elise who can control all these creatures at once. Lloyd replies that Elise is the sixth princess and his elder sister, who loves all kinds of animals. Suddenly, Elise comes there and leaps at Lloyd. Rolling around as she cuddles with him, Lloyd asks her to take it easy, but then she suddenly kisses him and knocks him out of his senses. Silpha panics on seeing this and prepares to revive him with a kiss. Just then Elias maid Eris comes to scold her, and she replies that she couldn't stop herself because her brother is so cute. When everyone settles down, Lloyd tells her that he came here to seek her assistance with the bear wolf he has recently adopted. Elias cuddles with Shiro, and Silpha tells him that they should head back now, because it doesn't seem that Elias can help them. However, Lloyd wants to give her a chance. He asks Elias to show one of her monsters to them, and she replies that she has already summoned one. Suddenly, a tall and gorgeous monster comes there, carrying a hairband. She introduces it as Luru, a lesser Fenrir, which is an advanced species related to bear wolves. Lloyd is amazed because he couldn't sense the monster coming, and what is even more shocking is that it stole Silpha's hairband without letting her know. On top of that, neither of them saw Elias giving it any command, and now Lloyd is intrigued. He immediately asks Elias to teach him how she could communicate with her monster without showing any sign. Elias says that the most important thing to communicate with any animal is love, and that answer leaves everyone a bit baffled. Elias says that if one has love, they can understand any monster. And then suddenly, all her pets surround her. The maid heiress apologizes to Lloyd, saying that Elias is a genius with a godlike riz when it comes to animals, and no one can learn anything from her. The princess is not happy to hear that and claims that anyone can do what she does with enough love in her heart. She says that they just have to feel it and release their feelings. That was a command for her pets to molest Sofa and Eris, and the creatures rip their clothes. Silpha is flustered and asks Lloyd to return back because commanding creatures with love is completely abstract and absurd. However, Lloyd has already begun mastering the art of loving creatures, and some of them are clinging to him. Sofa is shocked, but then she realizes that if Lloyd has started showing interest in love, then maybe there is hope for her to get closer to him. She imagines him leaping into her bosom and asking him to teach him more about love, while Lloyd realizes the mistake he was making. He was issuing orders to Shiro, but his sister was not ordering her pets around, rather, she was sharing her will with them. When Elias commanded the creatures earlier, Lloyd felt her mana release directly from her head into their head. That way, she could share exactly what she wanted from them, and they executed it perfectly. Lloyd focuses his mana, imagines what he wants Shiro to do, and then sends the visuals to Shiro's mind directly. The bear wolf receives his instructions, and suddenly runs around him in circles, exactly three times before jumping high in the air and barking just once. As it lands on the ground, Lloyd reaches to ruffle Shiro's fur to congratulate it on executing the instructions perfectly. Eris is stunned to see the seventh prince's genius, and Silpha is a bit disappointed that her dreams didn't come true. Elias, however, is upset that Lloyd is overcomplicating things. She claims that it is not about will or mana, but just about loving animals to make them your friends. Lloyd says that love is also an important factor, because without that, the animals won't listen to the human, and the human won't be able to understand them. He says that love is indeed a wonderful thing, and all three girls there are blown away by his cuteness. On Silpha's advice, Lloyd fills the form honestly, and then the receptionist gives him the crystal ball that will measure his power and rank him accordingly. He recalls that he used the crystal ball in his past life too, and it made his body emit a faint purple light because he had no magic. Lloyd is 90% sure that if he lets the crystal ball measure his full power right now, it will explode, and that will draw too much unwanted attention. So he compresses his mana to the point that it is only 1% of his true abilities and touches the crystal ball that shows that his magic is a rank but all other abilities are F rank. Overall, he gets an E rank and all the adventurers in the building laugh at him because even the weakest adventurers start at the D rank. However, 
Katarina is amazed because Lloyd's magic is a rank which is comparable to an experienced mage. She believes that he is the most promising adventurer since the person named Silver Blader. The adventurers are triggered, and they ask the receptionist how dare she compare a runt like him to the legendary Silver Blader who tore through hordes of monsters like they were paper and then suddenly vanished after becoming in a rank adventurer. Silpha controls her rage and asks Katarina to give them a quest to enter a dungeon right away. But she tells her that they need at least a B-rank adventurer to challenge a dungeon. Silpha says that she will re-register herself then, and suddenly, one man puts his hand on her shoulder, asking her to ditch the kid and come with him. The very next moment, Silpha chops off half of his mustache, and everyone panics. Katarina tells them that Silpha is the very silver blader they consider a legend. The men freak out on hearing that, and in the meantime, Katarina tells Silpha that if she re-registers, she will be demoted to rank C as per the guild policies. Suddenly, Tao arrives there, and smugly tells Lloyd that if he needs help with something, she is here for him. Silpha doesn't want Lloyd to be involved with Tao and starts heading out. Tao stops her, and Silpha asks her why she keeps bumping into them. She asks her if she has found her Robert already, and she gets depressed as she says that she can't find any clue about him at all. In search of Robert, Tao has been clearing dungeons in a frenzy, and she has become an a rank adventurer now. She suddenly grabs Lloyd, screaming that in exchange of helping him, she wants him to set her up on a date with Prince Albert. After that, Lloyd looks at some quests. While Silpha tries getting his robe back from Tao, Lloyd asks her why did she not tell him about her adventuring days, and she replies that she was acting as an adventurer just to become stronger. In the end, she found some enemies from the Assassin's Guild whom she could not defeat, so she had to retire. Soon after that, Lloyd and his party enter a random dungeon, and clear it quite easily. They retrieve the treasure chest, which is the dungeon's core as well. On the other hand, Albert goes to check up on Diane, and learns that they can resume their work when Lloyd returns in a few days. This worries Albert a little because a war is approaching them rapidly, and he wanted to have as much help as possible before it starts. Diane asks him to just wait a little longer, and then they can mass produce magic swords. But Albert tells him that the fact that they are getting along well like brothers is enough for him. He asks Diane to not worry about the fighting, but asks him to keep working hard, so that the swords he creates can save the lives of their citizens. Diane is not happy happy about this, but then he spots that Lloyd has returned successfully with the dungeon core. They happily resume their work, and with the high quality enchantment ink this time, Diane succeeds in creating a magic sword. Later, he takes it for a test run, and swings it to unleash a powerful fireball that completely obliterates the target. Diane and Albert are blown away because they didn't expect it to be this powerful, and they can't stop shivering when they see the crater the attack left behind. Lloyd also can't stop sweating from nervousness, and thinks that he should tone down things a bit from the next time. At night, Lloyd can finally relax in his bed after a long day's work. Shiro and Grimm also fall asleep as soon as they hit the floor, and Lloyd pets them when he suddenly notices the presence of a strange object in the garden. He tries analyzing what it is, but it seems like a hole in space. He turns around to see what's happening, and finds an assassin there, waiting for her chance to attack. The assassin hides behind the fountain while keeping an eye on Lloyd's room. But then he suddenly appears next to her. The assassin loses her composure and tries running away, but Lloyd has already put his barrier around them so that she can't escape. He teases the assassin, asking why is she trespassing in his home, and if she is ready to get punished for this. The lowly assassin throws away her cloak and apologizes to Lloyd for using her special move against her. A sweet, flowery smell is released from her body, and Lloyd starts feeling dizzy and numb as he inhales it. He realizes that it is poison, so he uses a purification spell to remove its effect. But the lowly assassin intensifies her poison attack. Lloyd is brought to his knees because of the poison, and Lowly tells him that there is nothing that can purify her poison. However, Lloyd has figured out her trick. The lowly assassin is transmuting the nature of her poison using magic so that no spell can purify it. He knows that there are some rare people in this world who are born with a special type of mana. These people are often feared because of their dangerous natural abilities, and are called the Blighted. The lowly assassin affirms that she is the Poison Blighted and has been spreading poison from her birth. She introduces herself as Ren, and the moth flying near her dies and disintegrates because of her poison. Ren then uses her poison on the barrier Lloyd has cast. The poison cracks the barrier, and then Ren shatters it with a kick. She then tells Lloyd that he has not taken a lethal dose of her poison, 
so he will just be unwell for a couple of days. With that, she immediately vanishes from the garden, and Lloyd is impressed by her overall abilities. Suddenly, Grimm comes there and asks him if he is fine. Lloyd reveals that he is using a high-level spell called Healing Breath to heal his body quickly, so he is not in any kind of danger. He changes his shirt, telling Grimm that the only reason he let the assassin go is so that he could track her to her base. He believes that Ren is a member of the assassin's guild that Silpha had told him about earlier. Lloyd tracks Ren through the city even though she has concealed her presence very efficiently. He knows that she rips a hole in space to conceal herself, but since he knows her trick, locating her is quite easy. Lloyd cheerfully heads out of the palace, and a few seconds after he leaves, Silpha and Shiro arrive there because they sense danger. On the other hand, Ren has reached the hideout of the Assassin's Guild, where their leader is not happy that she was found out and did not kill the witness. Ren claims that the one who saw her was a mere kid, and her mission was already a success by then because she found out some crucial information about the upcoming war. Ren believes that they can have a chance to participate in the war, but the big man tells her to shut up. He is pissed that she is acting like their true leader, who has ran away. While the two of them fight, the mommy of the group notices that they have company, and Lloyd decides to stop hiding now that someone has spotted him, he comes down from the roof and makes himself visible, much to Ren's surprise. Lloyd playfully struts towards them, and the Fees recognize him as the seventh prince who acts like a normal child but is in fact very powerful. The big guy wants to kill him so that he doesn't leak information about them, and on hearing this Lloyd removes his barrier, giving Grimm a heart attack. However, Lloyd laughs, saying that it would be a shame if he doesn't get to experience the special skills of the Assassin's Guild members. He copies the techniques he has learned from Tao and challenges the Assassins. A green-haired man attacks him first, but Lloyd blocks his attack. The man throws his cloak at him to blind him, and then reaches behind him for his next attack. He gets on his palms and launches rapid kicks at Lloyd, who blocks them all easily. The assassin is impressed by his skills, and does some cartwheels all over the place before attacking him again. Lloyd is ready to guard against him, but the assassin stretches and curves his hand like Luffy. Landing a hit on him, the assassin then twists his body around, introducing himself as the Blighted Babylon. Born with the powers of the Gamu Gamu fruit, Lloyd is amazed to see this, when suddenly, the masked assassin appears behind him and tells him to sink. Immediately, Lloyd feels super heavy and falls to his knees under his own weight. The big bald guy comes forth and says that the masked guy is called Crow, and he has the same powers as Inumaki from JJK. Lloyd uses physical enhancement magic to break free from Crow's cursed speech and avoid the heavy attack from the bald guy named Golly. However, he immediately gets caught in his real ability, which is to create a sticky fluid by transmuting his mana. Lloyd strains to get out of the sticky web, and is forced to leave his shirt behind to get free. As he is fangirling over the abilities of Crow and Golly, the mommy assassin attacks him from behind, but he blocks her twin swords using the fabric he borrowed from Babylon. He dodges all her attacks, so the mommy stabs her thigh instead. Surprisingly, a similar wound appears on Lloyd's thigh and the woman introduces herself as Talia, who can share her damage with anyone she can see. Lloyd can only smile like an idiot on learning how her powers function. Both he and Talia land on the ground, and she immediately attacks him again, and he keeps dodging. The assassins stand side by side next, telling Lloyd that now the introductions are complete, so they can finally end his life. However, he is smiling like a madman. He uses healing magic to instantly heal his wound, and Talia's wound also heals instantly. She is shocked, but Lloyd is amazed to see that her powers work like this too. He strengthens the scraps of clothes around his wrists and turns them into blades. He copies the fighting style of Silpha and tells the assassins to show him what they're made of. Dolly gets some PTSD flashbacks as he sees the image of Silpha is Lloyd. However, he and his friends have no time to talk about it, as the mad lad Lloyd is charging towards them. They all feel true fear and immediately dodge. Lloyd targets the flexible man Babylon first, who barely dodges his first attack. He attacks him again and smashes him to the ground, but Babylon manages to take no real damage from the blade's edge using his special abilities. Suddenly, Golly and Crow surround Lloyd from both sides and try to launch a combo attack. Crow tells him to get blown away, 
but Lloyd moves faster than sound, avoiding his attack and letting it hit the baldy instead. Golly is blown away and he even takes Talia with her, while Lloyd appears behind Crow to finish him. He hits Crow with a special combo move and doesn't let him tell him to stop. Lloyd realizes that until he completes a word, he can't use the full power of his cursed speech. Crow is about to use his power once more, but Lloyd hits him to the ground instead. Golly gets up to fight him, and Talia tells him to stop because they are glued together. He doesn't listen, and as he swings his fist around, all of her clothes are ripped. Talia curses the knucklehead for this, and then Lloyd attacks her without warning. She blocks his attack and warns him not to injure her, or he will get damaged too. Lloyd really wants to learn that through practical experience, and immediately eats Talia into a pillar. As she is turned backwards from the strong impact, Lloyd is also bent backwards and coughs blood, while remarking that her powers are really magnificent. Golly comes up behind him and holds his hands, but Lloyd gives him the slip, and the bald man is left holding just his fabric weapons. Lloyd then uses Tao's techniques and sends Golly flying, even though he uses his web to shield himself. Golly crashes right next to Ren, who falls to the ground in terror at Lloyd's unbelievable power. He moves towards her, asking her to let him see her poison again, but then Golly suddenly covers for Ren, saying that she can't control her poison mana, so everyone here will be caught up in it if she uses it. Lloyd remarks that none of them seem to have a decent control over their powers, and Golly tells him that he is right. He curses the uncontrollable powers that left them with no choice but to live as cursed outlaws. He attacks Lloyd again, but he quickly dodges and moves behind him before hitting him with a thunder palm. Ren is furious, and she attacks Lloyd for killing Golly, but he blocks her attack. Golly gets up and tells her to stop, because he is not injured at all. Instead, after Lloyd's last strike, his mana is completely under his control. No one can believe it. And Lloyd explains that he engraved a spell on Golly's back so that he can control his mana properly. Golly cries tears of joy, saying that his cursed power has finally vanished, and Lloyd tells him that he can use his power at his will now. He then calls the rest of the assassins and engraves a spell on their bodies too. Crow is moved to tears after he speaks normally after many years. Babylon and Talia also find that their powers are not activating by default anymore. Talia tries to activate her power and pulls her cheeks which hurts Babylon, proving Lloyd's point that they can control their powers now. Ren has also got a butterfly-shaped spell on her shoulder, and she tries to hide the fact that she is happy about it. However, as Golly brings a dress, she expresses her excitement about being able to wear anything she wants now. Soon, everyone welcomes Lloyd in their gang and they even give him some of Ren's clothes that fit him perfectly. She is not happy about that, and claims that he is their enemy, and Grimm starts arguing with her about it. Lloyd doesn't care, and asks everyone to show him their powers once more. But Golly says that before that, they must explain themselves to him. Lloyd says that he is fine, but the bald dude has already started rambling about their past. However, as he learns about the leader of the Assassin's Guild Jade, who has the power of teleportation, Lloyd suddenly gets excited about the story. Dolly says that Jade has probably the worst power out of them all because he can teleport anywhere at any given time, without his will. Despite that, he was the most cheerful one out of them, and suggested that they form the Assassin's Guild and take jobs that are too dirty for the Adventurer's Guild to handle. He came up with a coin with the sketch of a wolf and declared that every time they complete a mission. They would leave this coin at the site to prove to the world about their abilities and their intentions to bring world peace. He declared that one day, they won't have to live in the shadows anymore. And the very next moment, he got teleported, God knows where. Out of all this, Lloyd is only interested in the part about teleportation. And then suddenly a teleportation circle appears in front of him. And out of that comes a letter with the wolf mark of the Assassin's Guild. A few hours later, Silpha and Shiro arrive at the assassin's hideout to find Lloyd, but they don't find a single human there. However, there is a note from Lloyd, saying that he is going to visit the Lord of Lordost, their enemy territory, along with the assassin's guild. As this news reaches Arthur, he can't stop trembling in fear and anxiousness, unable to process what has happened. He thinks that the king of Lordost must have ordered the assassin's guild to kidnap Lloyd, and he wants to wage war against them. Diane manages to convince him that Lloyd can't be defeated so easily, and they should try to negotiate peacefully. 
However, Silpha produces the dirty clothes belonging to Lloyd she found in the cave. And on seeing this, both Arthur and Silpha are ready to wage war. Meanwhile, Lloyd is just flying his new buddies to Lord Ost for an errand, unaware of the troubles back at home. It turns out that the letter that the assassins received was from none other than their own leader Jade, who wrote out to them, claiming that he was transported to the territory of Lordost, but he managed to perform a coup on the lord who was trying to start a war, and has named himself the lord of that area. He then tells all of them to make their way to the manor, so he can give them all a proper welcome. The assassins seem overjoyed and very emotional at this letter, as they thought their leader was lost, but now they seem very happy and ready to leave in an instant. Golly bows down to the ground and thanks Lloyd for what he did and promises to pay him back in kind one day for sure. Meanwhile, Ren ends up making her way shyly to Lloyd and asks whether he could join them on their journey as she wants him to use his magic to fix Jade as well. Lloyd thinks for a second, but then grabs the letter as he examines it and asks them what do they think was used to send this letter here. The assassins find this question to be stupid, as it was obviously sent here by teleportation magic which Jade possesses. Lloyd however claims that the magic very hard to master, as even a small inconsistency can cause a lot of problems while transporting something. But this letter was very expertfully and precisely teleported to this location. That can only mean one thing, that Jade already knew how to take control of his abilities. The older assassins start thinking about this possibility, while wondering why would their leader betray them in such a manner. Ren however is still naive and believes optimistically that Jade might have learned how to control his abilities somehow and is honestly asking for them to come. But the other assassins are more cautious, wondering whether this is some sort of a trap. Lloyd turns to the lowly and tells her that if Jade already learned how to control his powers, then there is no use for him to accompany them. This saddens Ren who really felt safer with Lloyd around. Lloyd however is very fickle and immediately claims that he will still accompany them as he is interested in teleportation magic and wants to witness it on his own. He then calms Ren down by flicking her on the head as he tells her not to worry because he will deal with anything that goes wrong. They thank Lloyd as he decides to take them all for a ride on his supersonic air magic. He travels at the speed of sound while the assassin assassins are screaming for mercy as they have never traveled this way in such high speeds. Finally Lloyd stops in a forest where the assassins take her a deep breath as some of them feel motion sickness while baby is completely twisted in uncomfortable positions. Lloyd tells them to take a breather and hearing this, Ren claims that she will get them some food and rushes off inside the forest to hunt some wild game. Golly tells Lloyd that Ren seems to want to impress Lloyd with her skills in a forest which she learned because her poison curse ended up killing her parents, forcing her to live alone in the forest where she took care of herself. One day after Jade got teleported randomly, he came back with her wrapped in a tight ball as he explained that she is blighted with poison. The others were very apprehensive at this and told him that she could be dangerous if she can't control her poison. And moreover, she looks more like a rabid beast than a human. Jade would hear none of it, though as he cuddled and rubbed her all over his face calling her cute before spewing blood out of his mouth because of the poison as he falls to the ground. Baby Ren starts crawling away while the others tell Jade that it's for the best. But Jade would hear none of it and told them that he will live here alongside Ren no matter what and they all need to help him raise her up. The assassins at the end of the day were misunderstood kind-hearted people who decided to adopt the child as Golly became her teacher, Crow and Talia her dress designers, while Baby took the job of getting her good nutritious food. Years started passing by during which she would hide in the barrel to prevent her poison from leaking all over the place as she gets taught by the various people in her party and slowly began to consider them family as well. A long while later after countless failed attempts, Jade managed to engrave some spells on the costume that Crow and Talia designed. With the help of that, Ren could now stay outside the barrel without injuring other people with her poison. Lloyd touches the cloak that Jade engraved and told Golly that he would like to meet this person when finally Ren reappeared and cooked some food for them. The food looked horrendous like a bubbling pit of tar, so Baby asks Crow whether he could use his abilities to make the food taste good. This obviously pisses her off as she punches him in the stomach, knocking him out, and tells everyone to at least taste her cooking. Talia, on the other hand, calmly explains to her that they also have the seventh prince of the kingdom with them, and they can't serve him bad food at all. Ren seems hurt, but also understands the point, but when they turn around, they see both Lloyd and Grimm going at the food with their mouths full. 
claiming that it tastes very rich and good. Lloyd doesn't mind eating all this because in his previous life, he was completely broke and ate much worse than whatever Ren whipped up for him. The other assassins are surprised as they are from the slums and are still thinking whether to eat it or not. But Lloyd, even after being the seventh prince who probably only ate the best stuff, is devouring this food as if Grodon Ranze cooked it. The others take inspiration from this and start enjoying their share as well even asking for second servings. Gali continues his story and tells Lloyd that before Jade left, one day while they were enjoying food he ended up confessing the truth about how he is the third son of the Lord of Lordost. He claimed while crying that his family is a bunch of monster who do nothing other than plotting wars and murders, but he wanted to stop them. The only way he could have stopped them was through force and for that he needed powerful allies. He confesses that he sought them out because of their abilities, and was intending to use them in his plan to oust his family from the lordship, so that this cycle of war and destruction can be stopped. He looked at the ground, afraid of how his friends would take the confession, totally expecting them to leave him immediately. But to his surprise, they barely took notice, as they claimed that they always thought he was some rich, snotty kid, and told him that it didn't really matter to them whether their abilities were being used or not, because at the end of the day, they were considered outlaws. But because Jade struck a deal with the Adventurer's Guild to form an undercover suicide squad, they are close to becoming normal civilians with the bounty removed from their heads. Jade thanks them for their support and tells them that ever since birth he was cursed. His entire family was cursed making his entire life cursed but being with them was the only blessing he ever received in his life. The others ask him nonchalantly about when they are killing the Lord of Lordost, but Jade tells them that he is going to deal with it alone. He tells them that if they kill some nobles of a different territory, their bond with the Adventurer's Guild will be broken, and their bounty would be increased tenfold. Because of that he promised that one day he would kill his family and become the lord of that region so that every cursed and blighted person could live there in peace. Lloyd finds Jade very fascinating, and after finishing their meal they begin walking towards the manor. Lloyd ends up sleeping which they find very cute, but Grimm reminds them that Lloyd is a monster, as he is still maintaining an incredibly strong barrier in their sleep. While walking, Ren suddenly stops and tells them that they should leave Lloyd behind so that he can rest properly while they check out the manor for themselves. Gali looks at her and asks if she doesn't trust Jade, but she refuses, saying that she trusts him completely. But just in case, Gali agrees with this as they should scout out the location first before taking the prince and so they put him down on a flower bed so he can sleep while they decide to move on. Ren asks Grimm to guard Lloyd but he tells them that Lloyd is invincible, even while he is sleeping, and it would be better if he goes with them to make sure everything is fine. They enter the manor's battlements where they see a huge party going on, and even Grimm can't sense any sort of negativity coming out from them. They were trying to find Jade in the group when suddenly an egg-headed man finds them and asks them whether they are Jade's friend. Talio replies that they are, and immediately the egghead takes them to the party with a bang and sits them down on the table immediately pouring them drinks. They all are very flustered as they are not used to this kind of reception. Grimm feels relieved and decides to bring Lloyd here, but Ren holds on to him, claiming that she feels nervous and would like if Grimm stayed by her for a bit longer. Suddenly Jade appears in his lord's outfit, cheerfully greeting the others as he makes his way towards them. He changes his attire so that they feel better, while all of them walk towards him with tears in their eyes. Grimm finally frees himself to bring Lloyd, while Ren tries to say something but suddenly Jade's smile changes, as he claims that he doesn't really care, and uses his insane magic to force them to the ground. The pressure is incredible as Jade laughs at them for falling for his trick. Suddenly everyone surrounding them starts turning demonic. While Grimm realizes something is very wrong, and uses his magic to blast Jade away. He screams at them to run, but Jade appears behind him, and delivers such an insane kick that he falls near Lloyd, barely creeping towards him as he tries to inform Lloyd what just happened. Back at the manor Jade reveals that he is actually a demon named Gus who took control of Jade's body when he got teleported in his area. It took months to wear him down, but he finally took control of his body after Jade tried to kill himself in order to protect his friends. Unfortunately for him, Gus healed him in an instant and no matter how many times he tries, 
Gus healed him and finally took control of his body and his teleportation powers. Ren tries to scream at him with anger, but he just kicks her aside before destroying the clit that Jade gave her. He picks her up by the head and makes fun of how she killed her own parents when he notices a weird mark on her arm which wasn't there in Jade's memories. He asks who the hell put the mark on her, but she wouldn't answer. Gus starts using his mind control ability to seek the answer, but Ren simply bites her own tongue. Even then he was almost able to get the word out of her mouth when suddenly a huge amount of mana surrounds the assassins covering them in a shell while a massive energy beam levels the entire area as all the demon spawn disappear. The assassins look up thankfully to see Lloyd with a serious face looking down, ready to throw hands at the person who troubled him in his sleep. He descends down to the ground after the spell and quiets Ren down as she cries uncontrollably. He immediately starts checking out her injuries and heals her mouth, asking why would she try something like biting her own tongue. The demons in the area are horrified to see the huge crater as they shiver with fear, not knowing whether their lord Gus died or not, and who this incredibly powerful magician is. Gus however is hard to kill and appears behind one of the demons pushing him into the crater filled with lava, as he looks at them with contempt, asking what the hell are they looking at. Lloyd turns towards the assassins and tells them to run away as quickly as possible as he will handle the rest. Ren tries to protest, but Gali grabs her and starts making a run for it. She tells him that they can't leave Lloyd alone, but Gali tells her that this is beyond their level, and they can never hope to match their powers. Gus turns towards the demons and asks whether they are all dumb as their entire goal was to take control of the assassin's body. He tells them that the assassins are adept at hiding, so if they lose their track, they might never be able to find them again. He tells them to chase after them and threatens to kill them if they fail to retrieve those assassins. The terrified demons start trying to chase the assassins who are already almost outside the castle gates. Lloyd looks at them lazily and uses a barrage of amazingly powerful spells to completely destroy any demon that tried to go after them, shocking the assassins as they witness the true power of the seventh prince. Lloyd keeps floating in the air while Gus appears on one of the towers, suddenly two of the lower class demons jump in front to attack, while at the same time Gus uses his cursed speech to try and kill Lloyd. The attacks get blocked by his mana shield, but to his surprise, the cursed speech manages to slip through the barrier. Lloyd takes his advice and slips past the spell which ends up hitting the demon behind him and immediately takes his life. Lloyd immediately uses his magic to take a closer look at the inner workings of the spell and realizes that this cursed speech is not a spell, but a huge ball of mana itself, which not only killed the body, but also the demon possessing it via cardiac arrest. He finds this very interesting as he realizes that normal spells that convert mana into a physical form to attack are easy to block, as the shield can simply survive all the solid attacks. But this special cursed speech which is pure mana itself is like liquid which slows down in speed but manages to penetrate the shield without any other issues. Grimm claims that if they are dealing with someone like Paz, he could easily overwhelm home with his mana. But this monster can immediately stop Lloyd's heart at will, which makes it complicated. Gus on the other hand looks at the lesser demons running after the assassins, and looks disgusted because they are so weak that they can be killed by normal sorcery. Grimm tells Lloyd to take it more seriously as this demon can be very troublesome. He explains that there are 10 classes of demons. The demons that are running away are trash that are ranked at level 10, while for reference Paz was level 8. Lloyd asks what level Grimm is at, and he claims that he is at level 3, which makes Lloyd believe that Gus might actually be a level 1 demon. Grimm however looks terrified as he claims that the situation is much worse as Gus is even more dangerous than rank 1 demons. He is from the netherworld itself, which means he is more or less a demon lord. He explains that even a 100 level 1 demons can't even land a scratch on Gus. That's how insanely strong he is. Lloyd smiles and claims that this demon lord is a pretty big dirt bag, as he starts floating towards it. Grin starts sweating as he tells Lloyd that this time even he is outmatched, and that they should make a run for it. But Lloyd wouldn't listen as he goes even closer to the monstrous demon. The demon asks Lloyd who he is, and Lloyd cheekily responds that he is merely the seventh prince of a kingdom. Gus thinks for a moment and claims that he thinks Jade wanted to meet him once, but he can't be bothered to remember why exactly. Lloyd tells him that even he wanted to meet Jade, but because of an asshole called Gus, he can never meet him now. He claims that it is a debt that Gus would have to repay considering that he even tried attacking the assassin guild which belonged to his kingdom. Gus looks at him with dangerous eyes and claims that because of him, 
His lair has been destroyed alongside a lot of his demons. Both of them look at each other eager for a fight, and with the same madness, challenge each other for a duel to death. Grimm again tells Lloyd that this fight is not something he should take, and that they should run. But Lloyd is already dialed in as he wonders how much mana he will need to kill him. Grimm thinks about how it would be impossible as even level 10 demons are pretty dangerous, but even if you consider them a fish, they might die with the right amount of mana pressure. But this demon is on a different level altogether. He is like the Megalodon that lives in the deepest sea, and no amount of mana pressure will ever feel annoying to him. Gus immediately grabs a piece of mana into a shard and shoots it towards Lloyd who immediately employs his shield. But even after that the shard almost penetrates through which scares the crap out of Grimm as this was Lloyd heavy duty barrier with multiple shields which stopped Grimm's strongest attacks without a problem. But this monster just used a mana scrap to break it. Gus gets excited to see how strong Lloyd is and this time creates innumerable spears of dark mana, which he shoots at lightning fast speed towards him. The barrier takes a bunch of spears before breaking, but Lloyd immediately creates another one. A chase ensues, as Gus keeps shooting spears of mana at him, while Lloyd keeps creating new barriers and trying to dodge as many hits as he can. The chase ensues for the longest time, which is shown with beautiful animation which you should watch on your own, you lazy idiots. But after a while, Gus teleports on top of Lloyd, which he didn't expect, and kicks the barrier away, which breaks it in half scaring the crap out of Grimm who can't even begin to understand Gus's powers. The spears immediately join to create a massive missile which would have killed Lloyd. But he uses his massive mana pool to create a huge stone wall from the ocean bed which takes the head and breaks in half. The fight was so incredible that both the assassins and the demons forget everything and start watching the show when the demons remember they have to capture these people. And Golly screams at Baby to quickly climb and open the main gate. Gus is impressed at the fact that Lloyd was able to survive even after his teleportation skill, but Lloyd snaps back by saying that the teleportation magic belongs to Jade and not him. Gus simply laughs it off, claiming that Jade never knew how to use his skills, but for a creature with his amount of mana expertise, controlling this skill is only instinctual. It's like how you don't teach a bird how to fly. They just know it since they are born. In comparison, these blighted humans are like rats with wings who don't know how to use it properly. He then creates a thousand more spears and asks Lloyd what will he do now, whether he will block, dodge, or simply run away. Before Lloyd could even think though Gus uses a dirty trick and teleports his spear behind him, stabbing Lloyd straight in the heart. He doesn't even stop at that and within a moment stabs Lloyd with multiple spears as he lays there still and unmoving. Meanwhile, the demons attack the assassins, but Golly uses his sticky web to tie them to the ground, while Crow uses his cursed speech to force them to get stuck even more. Meanwhile, Baby manages to find the lever and pushes it hard, opening the gate a bit. He screams at them to run through so he can close it but the demons use their powers to break through the spells and start chasing them once again. The assassins try to run away, but Talia stays back and uses her special magic skill and cuts herself on the feet, which makes all the demons fall down as well. Gali screams at her to run, but she tells him to leave her be as she will stop them from chasing after them. The demons mock her abilities as they claim that they can simply regenerate, but without a second's hesitation, she stabs her other feet. Forcing all of them down, the demons now realize that this woman is unhinged as she tells the others to run into the forest and immediately hide their tracks. Golly immediately pushes Crow and ran out of the gate and shuts it down behind him and walks up to Talia. She tells him to run away as she can't control her powers yet and might harm him, but he tells her not to worry as he is with her till the end. He claims that she can't handle them alone, but Talia tells him that she had a plan and was going to end her life with the sword. Golly claims that he already knew that and tells her that he is ready to die with her. Talia simply smiles at her comrade, while Ren screams at them to come with her as she can't see them die. The monsters panic as they realize that if this woman kills herself, they all will die with her. So they start running towards her. But Golly stops them with his webs as Talia thinks about how many times Jade tried offing himself as she puts the sword to her throat. Meanwhile, Gus laughs at the humans, claiming that he thought Lloyd would entertain him for longer, when he suddenly realizes that the thing that he stabbed was merely a statue of Lloyd. Suddenly Lloyd appears in front of him with a sword and tries to slice his head off. But Gus manages to teleport away at the last moment happy that Lloyd is still alive to entertain him. Gus tells Lloyd not to disappoint him and give him a good fight. 
but Lloyd calmly asks whether they can move this fight somewhere else as his family is coming. This surprises the demon when suddenly a bunch of archers and mages start shooting magic fire arrows at the lower class demons which shocks Ren as she doesn't understand what's happening. Suddenly the main gate is sliced to shit and Albert walks through with his sword drawn followed by Silva and everyone else. Ren cries out of relief as Albert tells his men to move forward and destroy any demons that come in their way. The demons are set ablaze, and Ren is relieved that help is finally here. Crow feels that he has seen Silpha somewhere before, but he cannot remember it well. Albert and Silpha hear it, and they turn around to give them a death stare. Soon, the assassins are on their knees, shivering in terror as Albert ponders what to do with them. Diane tells him that the demon mob should take priority right now, but Silpha says that dealing with the assassins' guild comes first. She points her sword at them, and asks them where is Lloyd. They freak out, and then Silpha pulls out a pocket watch telling them that for each lie they tell her, she will kill one of them. Golly trembles and stutters as he reveals that Lloyd is currently fighting at the castle. Albert asks who is Lloyd fighting and why. Ren replies that he is fighting the boss of the demons for them, but Baby shuts her mouth, reminding what Lloyd had asked them to promise earlier. Earlier, when they were eating, the sleepy Lloyd had asked them to keep his strength and grim a secret from the people of the palace. Golly asked him why would he like to keep it a secret and he replied that he doesn't want any attention that will distract him from his magic studies. Now, Ren wonders what should she say. Silpha tells them that their one minute of silence is almost over, so Ren panics and says that Lloyd is fighting a total loser right now. The others also try supporting her statement, but they look like a bunch of idiots and Silpha doesn't trust them at all. She plans to end Ren's life first, but Albert stops her. Golly and others start sucking up to Albert, saying that a kind and wise person like him will surely hear them out. However, Albert sternly tells them to shut up. He pulls out Lloyd's underwear that they found in the assassin's headquarters, and asks them why would Lloyd fight for the people who dared strip him naked. Golly says that the clothes were just covered in his fluids, so he left them to dry, not realizing how incriminating his words sound. Albert and Silpha are in full murder mode now, but Ren stands up to them. She admits that they would not believe outcasts like them so easily, and she is ready to accept any punishment they give out. However, she wants them to believe her just one time. She says that the demons took away Jade, who was the person she adored the most from her, and Lloyd is fighting the demons because of that. Everyone stands silently as they ponder her words, but then suddenly, a demon-possessed human attacks her. Out of nowhere, Princess Elias comes there riding her majestic fox Larue that bites the demon and saves Ren. As the fox chews and swallows the demon, Elias says that they can trust Ren. Because if she had any ill intentions, Luru would gobble her up first. Albert decides to trust his sister's word, and claims that the demons are their new priority now. He orders Silpha to find Lloyd and retrieve him, and she begins leaving to fulfill the order. Ren panics and clings to Silpha, trying to stop her by saying that Lloyd is fighting a total weakling, so he doesn't need any help. Silpha tells her to let go, or she will strike her first. But Ren holds on to her despite being afraid. Suddenly, she notices the teleportation magic circle in the air and then some dark energy spears rain down on them, before anyone can even realize what is happening, the bridge is destroyed. Diane looks down and finds that the demons are trying to cross the river and reach behind them. Albert panics, realizing that if the demons reach behind them, they will be trapped. He orders his soldiers to retreat, but Silpha is deeply troubled now because she was so close to reaching Lloyd. Turns out that Gus attacked the bridge because Lloyd asked him to do it as that would let them fight freely. As Gus sees the forces retreat, he tells Lloyd that they should resume their battle. He snaps his fingers and teleports a bunch of spears at Lloyd's location to stab him, but Lloyd evaded that attack with great speed. Gus sends some more dark spears to chase after him, but Lloyd seems to be focused entirely on his sword, even as he evades the spears. He looks at the ground and finds that Albert and his forces are successfully keeping the escaping demons under control with their magic swords, and thinks that he can fight Gus without holding back now. The demons on the ground are set ablaze by the fire attack from the knights, but they are not harmed at all. Despite all the screams of pain, they can feel the burning sensation, but they are able to regenerate any damage their body faces. Albert realizes that the demons are quite resistant to magic and he is not sure if he should kill them because they are still in human bodies. Suddenly, Dion uses his special magic sword and hurls a giant fireball towards the demons, blowing them away with an explosion. Even that doesn't do anything. And the knights wielding the magic swords are also running out of stamina now. This stresses out Albert, who wonders what to do now. He thinks that they must change their tactics to allow Luru and Silpha to fight against the demons up close. He turns back to see if they are ready, and finds that Silpha is missing. Silpha has climbed on Shiro, 
and she leads him to the broken end of the bridge, asking him to rush towards Lloyd. Golly and others tell her that it is impossible, and she realizes it too, but she keeps coming up with stupid ways to cross the broken bridge. Shiro also wants to see his master badly, and he takes the leap of faith, but ends up falling in the river. Silpha is preparing to jump after him too, when suddenly, someone climbs up the bridge and attacks her. She dodges the first attack, and then draws her swords to block the rest of them. The attacker turns out to be the Humpty Dumpty demon, who praises Silpha's skill. He tells her that she is good, but not as good as him. He declares that while his associates here are just 10th class demons, he is an 8th class demon, as well as a practitioner of the demon blade technique. Thinking about the class system among demons, Silpha wonders what class Paz was in. However, it does not matter, because Humpty seems quite weaker than him. On the other hand, Albert is still wondering if there is a way to save the people possessed by the demons, when a demon launches a surprise attack on him. No one is ready to fend off against him, but surprisingly, Baby arrives to save the prince. He grabs the demon's neck and twists it 180 degrees. Albert thanks him, and then remarks that he didn't even hesitate dealing such fatal damage to the demon. Baby tells him that he is a nice guy, just like their leader Jade was. He then says that despite being assassins, they don't take just life and death lightly, and he attacked without holding back earlier because the demon possessed are already done for. The demon tries recovering even from the damage he just received, while Baby tells Albert that there is no way to save the demon possessed, because their minds are already dead. Just then, the demon collapses after failing to regenerate his body. Hearing Baby's words and seeing the gruesome sight makes Albert realize what he must do. He approaches the burning demons and pulls out his magic sword. He does some Naruto hand signs to activate a powerful flame spell. He wants to apologize to the people of Lordust because he cannot save them, but he wants to set them free from their suffering now. With that sentiment, he unleashes his spell and makes fireballs rain from the sky. The fireballs explode as they hit the ground, and the demons start screaming in pain as they burn. Albert tells his knights to stop holding back and put all their strength into exterminating the enemy. On the other hand, Silpha launches a barrage of swift strikes at Humpty Dumpty, who keeps blocking them and backing away. He jumps up and then uses a drilling move to push Silpha back, but she simply blocks his attack. The demon takes to the skies again and launches some flying slashes, but Silpha deflects them too. Next, they use a special move and charge at each other with full speed. Their clash is too fast for anyone else to see it, but they seem equally matched at this point. They keep on attacking each other with their special moves, and just the shockwaves are enough to damage the bridge. They separate after that, and as Silpha lands, her hairband breaks and blood starts flowing down from her forehead. Humpty Dumpty has also taken an equal amount of damage, but he can easily recover thanks to his demonic powers. He begins laughing, saying that humans can never beat demons, however, he admits that Silpha is strong, which is why he wants her body now. He claims that by doing so, he will master his technique as well as hers. He suddenly takes a different stance and charges towards Silpha, using the Lordost sword technique. She reacts a bit late to it, and her dress gets cut off, even as she manages to dodge the attack. Humpty says that the previous master of this body was quite hardworking and skilled in martial arts. He showed his calloused hands that depict how hard he must have worked. Humpty says that he has all the memories of the previous owner of this body, and he will use them well. He declares that humans are just clothing to demons like him. And now, he is going to take over Silpha. Silpha doesn't take those words kindly, and she leaps high in the air to use the demonic technique that Humpty used a while ago. He is shocked to see her using that move and barely blocks it at the last moment. He is terrified that Silpha also knows demon sword technique, but she tells him that she just learned it by watching, because she is not so pathetic that she can't learn another style without taking over someone's body. Humpty is furious at this insult, but Silpha doesn't mind him. Instead, she calls to Shiro, who climbs back to her side. She begins scouring through its fur and finally finds a special sword that Lloyd personally made for her. As she draws the blade, she tells Humpty to bear witness what humans can achieve. Beginning a few days ago, Silpha was training to get stronger so that she could deal with demons like Paz herself. However, when she used her full power to swing the sword, the sword ended up bending, and the dummy target started spinning uncontrollably before reeling out. Silpha was disappointed. But just then, Lloyd and Diane came to visit her with a brand new sword. She was delighted to receive it, and Lloyd told her that it is a magic sword, but he has not put any fancy spells in it. However, he had made it extremely strong and flexible so that it could handle Silpha's full power. He told her that she could even cut down a demon with it. Demons are basically psychic beings, but they can't do much without a body, so they create their own or possess a human. If their body dies, the demon inside it dies too. 
Sylpha asked Lloyd why did he chose those spells for her sword, and he nervously said that she always seems to be holding back when she swings her sword, so he thought that she might be afraid that it would break, so he made one that would not break. Sylpha was overjoyed and hugged Lloyd, thanking him for paying that much attention to her. Diane interrupted their moment and suggested that they name the sword too. Sylpha recalled her failure against Paz, and decided to name the sword Demonbane to indicate her ambition to never lose to another demon in the future. Now, she draws the Demonbane and says that she will prove the effectiveness of the name right now. Humpty is furious at her, even though he is sweating because of nervousness. He calls Sylpha delusional for thinking that she can beat him. He laughs, saying that this kingdom will be destroyed by the demons, for no particular reason except fun. Humpty says that Gus created this entire elaborate plan to lure Jade here. He made the underlings possess the bodies of the people of Lordost and began spreading news of war. Jade had no choice but to come back home because he wanted to avoid that war at all costs, and that proved to be his fatal mistake. The assassins are furious on learning that the demons did such horrible things to Jade, and Ren cannot control her rage. She charges at Humpty for revenge, but Sylpha just smacks her, telling her that she is getting in her way. She then takes her stance, and tells Ren to not worry, because she will avenge Jade and make sure that the demons can't destroy this kingdom. Humpty says that he will prove her wrong with his ultimate move. He charges at her. But Sylpha draws her blade, slashes him, and then sheets it back before he can even blink. Humpty's body is split into many small parts, and he splurts out blood everywhere as he dies. Sylpha covers her sword in a delicate lace, and then glances back at the dead body of her enemy, looking absolutely cold and menacing. If you liked this video, make sure to subscribe for part 11. And make sure to check out this brand new anime about a lonely guy who marries his childhood crush and learns how to become the strongest spy.